Well, good morning, Professor Ignatov, Excellencies, dear friends. Thank you very much for having me here. It's actually my first ever visit to this university. And I'm very delighted to be here to share some thoughts from Latvia on Eastern Partnership. I always like the titles of whatever lectures or panels or discussions that ends up with the ending Ku Vadis. I think that the very simple answer is nobody knows <laughs> where you are going to end up in about five or ten years, not only with Eastern Partnership, but even with uh, the changing Europe or European Union or actually the globe itself. However, um, what I will try to do, I will try to deliver as short as possible what you call lecture, because I very much uh, look forward to have questions, to have debate, because that's where I feel more comfortable than just listening to myself and uh, delivering uh, whatever serious uh, visionary statements that normally foreign ministers are supposed to do. But uh, if you look at the Eastern Partnership, I think that the 10th anniversary is a very interesting point of looking back at how the Eastern Partnership started, where it was five years ago, and where it could be in about five or ten years from now. Ten years ago, in 2009, I think we all had a kind of optimistic view on the world. It seemed that uh, uh, the European project, European Union, is uh, developing in the most positive way. The EU was very attractive to countries in the eastern neighborhood, in western Balkans, and indeed also in the southern neighborhood. Well, we were having financial crisis of 2008, 2009. We were having a lot of discussions about the future of Eurozone, but it seemed that one issue, uh, attractiveness of the European Union, achievement of the Union is something that uh, should be considered as a success story. And countries like Georgia, countries like Moldova, countries like Ukraine at that time, we're very much looking at EU as a role model and also willing to join. So, first five years with the vision of Eastern Partnership as the possible anteroom of next EU candidate countries was very much on the agenda. However, there were also three members of the partnership or Eastern Partners that were not saying that they want to join the EU, at least not for observable time being Belarus, Armenia and Azerbaijan. Uh, however, I think that what we have seen from 2009 to 2014, preparation of association agreements with four Eastern partner nations, Armenia, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, and then following drama of 2013, actually I witnessed that drama here in Vilnius when we had Eastern Partnership Summit in November 2013 when around 10 o'clock in the evening the foreign ministers of EU were kind of discussing uh, about extension of our offer to Ukraine to sign association agreement by 6 o'clock in the morning the next day and uh, when we woke up, we were told by then president of Ukraine that no, we are not going to sign this association agreement and what followed, we all know. So we have seen that actually first five years were years of optimism, years of uh, kind of visionary feelings about Eastern Partnership for those nations that want uh, to become EU members to get most of support in their reform process in their European aspirations and also creating framework of support of debate with those nations that were not willing to come to EU but at least to have some uh, more closer interaction. Then it was 2014, uh, the probably year that one can describe as uh, annus horribilis for uh, Europe the invasion of Russia in Crimea, occupation of Crimea, and also the war in the eastern part of uh, Ukraine launched by, by, by Russia. And then, of course, 
On one hand, we have seen uh, solidarity of the European Union, sanctions being imposed, association agreements being signed with three countries, except uh, one, I, men I mentioned Armenia, that was also preparing to sign association agreement in 2013, but under the pressure, this country uh, withdrew its um, consent uh, on, on this kind of uh, cooperation framework. And to some extent, uh, next five years till 2019, those are a bit mixed feelings because what we have seen, it's increasing reluctance of many of EU member states to have a very uh, strong commitment to European perspective for Eastern partner nations. We have seen also that to some extent Eastern partnership summits have become also the kind of battleground to settle some of the internal disputes of some of Eastern partners. It's increasingly difficult, frankly, and I remember again my own experience in 2015 when we were hosting Eastern Partnership Summit in Riga to agree on declaration of uh, EU heads of state and government with uh, Eastern partner heads of state of government because of territorial issues, because of different points of view on how to treat that or another fact on the ground. But on the other hand, what we have seen actually is also that uh, Eastern Partnership has become more structural, more organized, and actually if we compare EU's policy uh, in the Eastern neighborhood with EU's engagement in the Southern neighborhood, then I would say that uh, Eastern neighborhood has more structured approach by EU. We have regular summits, we have regular ministerial meetings, we have regular uh, conferences uh, of different kinds. We are looking in more sectoral cooperation. Uh, I do believe that uh, our cooperation in energy sector, in transportation, also tackling hybrid warfare, assisting, and by the way, mutually assisting each other against uh, propaganda warfare that we have seen uh, from the Russian Federation. Those have been the facts that I could actually say as the positive development. So where we are right now, we are celebrating 10th anniversary of Eastern Partnership. Uh, we have had some good meetings in spring uh, at ministerial level and also there was a meeting between uh, President of the European Council and Heads of State and Government of Eastern Partner Nations. Uh, but we didn't have any kind of celebratory summit, which we have postponed for hopefully 2020. And uh, we have now the kind of situation where I do believe that next five to ten years are going to be extremely interesting and extremely challenging for all of us and also for our Eastern partners. First of all, what is right now clear? Uh, and this is something that I really don't like, I don't accept it, but I see also the real facts on the ground. It is absolutely clear that uh, after our own EU's failure to agree on, on, on the beginning of accession talks between EU and North Macedonia and Albania, the European perspective, the European aspirations for some of Eastern partner nations will not be approved by EU in coming years. If we are not able even to deliver on the promises we have made uh, to some of Western Balkan nations who have delivered their own part, then it is absolutely clear that uh, we will need to manage expectations also in the Eastern Partnership uh, program. Uh, second, it is absolutely clear that Eastern Partnership, but that was also clear from the very beginning, is not anteroom for enlargement. Those are two different processes. Uh, with all those, let's say, not very optimistic news, I still believe that the Eastern Partnership needs to be preserved in its current form for two distinct reasons. The first one, it's the only way how to keep engagement of the European Union in the Eastern neighborhood at the top priorities of EU. We are going to have the new Commission very soon, we are going to have the new President of the European Council very soon, and we are having the new European Parliament, which is very important that even if the caveats I have just uh, mentioned are there, 
there are regular meetings of heads of state of government of EU and, and Eastern partners. It is very important that we continue meeting and discussing issues with our Eastern partners uh, in different formats. And it is also, and that's the second reason, it is very important that the EU supports those partner nations that want to conduct reforms, that want to uh, harmonize their economies and their uh, standards with the EU alive, and we need to provide uh, finances and, and also resources also in the next uh, multi-annual financial framework of the European Union. This is a bit uh, probably disappointing for those people who are hoping to join the EU very soon, uh, but uh, there is also some realities within the EU that we need to take into account. Uh, second, I do believe that we are seeing uh, and I already mentioned that increasing sectoral cooperation. If we can work with those Eastern partner nations that are interested in more interconnectivity when it comes to transportation, when it comes to energy, when it comes to digital agenda, then it's something that I believe we all at EU right now 28, very soon 27, by 31st of January, inshallah, as they say, uh, we, will, uh, we, will, we will be able to agree. And here I think that there are plenty of opportunities how incrementally uh, to get uh, countries like Ukraine, countries like Moldova or countries like, like Georgia closer to EU. And as once I believe it was former president Ilves of Estonia said, uh, referring to the Baltic experience of uh, both integration in NATO and the EU. At one point, we became so close to EU and NATO that nobody could reject us on the argument they are not like us. So I think that it will require a lot of effort and a lot of time of uh, those uh, partners that I call associative or association partners. Uh, Ukraine, Georgia and Moldova. And then of course there is a bit different path for three other partners, Armenia, Azerbaijan and Belarus. Uh, because those countries have not expressed their willingness to join the EU. Actually two of those nations are part of Eurasian Economic Union. However, what I see that recently we are developing very good cooperative uh, framework between EU and Armenia through signing the a strategic uh, agreement. I still believe that we need also to address our relations with Belarus, and I will come to that a bit later, through partnership priorities, through visa facilitation, and we are also preparing a strategic uh, um, partnership or um, bilateral EU-Azerbaijan agreement on, uh, on cooperation and uh, more uh, partnership with this uh, country. So, uh, sectoral cooperation, political agenda, those are two things at least for coming five years, helping those countries to address those issues that need to be addressed. And then, uh, well, things change and we need then at some point in five years or ten years really to reconsider uh, where we are and my country, Latvia, I also know our Baltic friends in Estonia and Lithuania, also in Poland. We will be pushing for European perspective. We will be reminding that and we will be keeping this on the table because if this is totally off the table, then also this kind of uh, perspective disappears. So if we understand that uh, this is currently the situation where uh, we need to have more work, less, let's say, political statements, less kind of uh, expectations or managing those expectations. We still believe that it is very important uh, to do that. Uh, there are two countries that I believe will be very crucial for the future of Eastern Partnership and actually that will be also the litmus test where EU is heading when it comes to its eastern, uh, let's say, neighborhood policy. One is Ukraine and another is Belarus. I mention Belarus not because I'm here in this university and I, as 
Mr. Rector, you have just told me uh, you have about 95% of Belarusian students. But I believe that this is really going to be very interesting development in coming years, uh, especially between EU and uh, this country. On Ukraine, uh, well, first of all, I think that uh, to some extent Ukraine is a litmus test not only for Eastern Partnership, but actually for the whole European security architecture. If we are going to see some positive developments in the implementation of Minsk agreements, if we can see that uh, we are returning to some norm of pre-2014, we can really start to speak about the possibility of trying to establish the security zone from Lisbon to Vladivostok. If we don't see those developments, then uh, I think that we are going to see this kind of permanent cold peace in Europe extending for decades. Having said that, uh, and seeing you events in Ukraine, I am a bit concerned that right now we are kind of shifting from uh, pushing Russian Federation that actually started the whole drama in, in Europe, uh, from pushing Russia to pushing Ukraine. I think this is not fair, and I think that here uh, we need to have more strategic debate at the EU, how we are going to approach some of the new realities in the continent. Second, it's reform process in Ukraine. I think what we have seen, the election of President Zelensky and also the new Verkhovna Rada with so big majority, any politician nowadays can dream about those figures. Frankly, I would be loving to have my own party to get 73% uh, approval rating. Uh, well, we were polling at six uh, the last elections. Uh, however, uh, this is great support, this is great trust and credit, but it is also great responsibility and the management of expectations is going to be very difficult. So this gives Ukraine one or two years of the golden of opportunity to reform some of those sectors they are struggling to do. If they are successful, if the public sees the result, then I think we will be seeing fundamental change also in the attitude of the European Union towards Ukraine. If there is a failure, I think we are going to see a very disastrous consequence for the whole Eastern neighborhood policy. Because there are different opinions within the EU, how we should divide our attention, how we should divide our resources, where our interests are from Latin America and Africa to China and uh, Middle East peace process and also events in Syria. And all those are demanding attention of the EU. They are all important for us. But I also I am concerned that the mind of media and the mind of politicians is actually switching uh, from one headline to another headline. And if you are not in the news, if you are not on the policy makers agenda, then actually everyone forgets about that or another region. And then we are waking up at one point uh, with, with the kind of bad feeling that we have again uh, lost momentum or we again have lost uh, that or another uh, uh, point of, of our own engagement and we are losing again. So two issues with Ukraine. Uh, one is how we are going to see implementation of Minsk agreement, how we are going to see Normandy summit. There are some good signs, there are also some worrying signs, and also internal processes. So Ukraine is fundamental. Belarus, well, uh, this is a bit different story. I don't believe this country is going to become liberal democracy anytime soon. I don't believe this country is going to announce that it wants to join European Union or even wants to have European perspective. We respect that. We respect uh, the decision of Belarus as it stands. We understand also that this country wants to have more balanced relations also with European Union. And my belief and also belief of Latvian government is that in this case, we need to engage more. We need to have more political engagement. Well, I have been visiting Belarus quite frequently during my tenure as foreign minister. I still remember my first meeting in 2013 where 
we were discussing a lot about releasing political prisoners, human rights issues, political freedoms, media freedoms. My last visit was in July and we continue to discuss some of those issues. And I think that uh, also Eastern Partnership gives this unique opportunity to raise issues that range from economic and trade relations to what also are very important to us, issues of values, issues of political freedoms. There are not many countries anymore or many unions in the world that are raising human rights or political freedoms uh, as often as European Union or its member states. Be it China, be it uh, uh, countries in Latin America, be it countries in Asia or Africa, those issues are always on the agenda. Um, and also I think that uh, we have had very good track record also when it comes to our Eastern partners. Second, I also believe that uh, we need to balance this kind of um, relationship that Belarus has with Russia within its union state for also our own security reason. Uh, Latvia has developed also a good dialogue between defense ministries, between our general staffs, because as you know we have NATO contingents in all three Baltic states and in Poland. We have now hotlines, information exchange in order to decrease any possibility of whatever let's say accidents that they can be and uh, I think that our militaries are overall satisfied with the level of information exchange with the level of mutual trust building that we have. We also have some issues that are particularly important also here in this country in Lithuania but is also important for my country Latvia that is nuclear safety issues. I think that during last three meetings I have had with my foreign, uh, with colleague foreign minister Mackey and also with president Lukashenko. We have addressed those issues. We keep pressing on more transparency and more international expert engagement. And I also believe that uh, such kind of issues are best addressed only if you have direct dialogue. So from that point of view, there are plenty of issues why Latvia as the nation that borders Belarus is interested in having uh, the intense dialogue between uh, Europe and Belarus. However, there is also one overarching big question that I will leave unanswered and I will also almost end this lecture with that question is we don't know what is going to happen, let's say, in relations between Belarus and Russia in five years. If you look at five years period, and that is going to be year 2024, uh, where a term of President Putin <coughs> expires. According to constitution, he is not able to run for the third term. And we are all watching very closely all those rumors and signs about closer integra integration between Russia and Belarus, about the union state or even the kind of joint institutions development which I think also should be addressed from our own perspective, from our own interest and also from the interest of the European Union. So plenty of reasons to watch Belarus, to engage with Belarus, plenty of reasons to watch Ukraine and engage with Ukraine. And I apologize that I didn't devote so much time to other countries. All of them are important. But since this is the limited lecture and limited time, if there are interests about uh, other Eastern partner nations or anybody uh, wants to ask uh, more detailed questions, I will be happy to provide also answers. So thank you very much. I'm very much looking forward to questions and I'm very much looking forward to some kind of comments. Even if you disagree, you are welcome. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Indeed, it's a, a very well-organized reflection on 10 years of Eastern Partnership Program, what has been achieved. Obviously, some of the countries, uh, they are labeled as this, uh, you know, uh, active players of Eastern Partnership, some of them less. The country, most of our students, and we all care, first of all, foremost, is Belarus, but not only Belarus. Uh, because we believe it's important to understand the whole uh, process uh, in, in, in the regional scale. So before I pass the floor to questions from students, I have one simple question to you, Minister. Imagine 
um, some of our students has his or her grandmother or grandfather in Belarus. And this grandmother or grandfather asks, look, uh, uh, why would we need this assistant partnership? What is the point of this program? Well, probably we would say, look, you can get visa-free access. This is what Ukrainians have, Moldovans have, uh, what Georgians have. So you will not need to have Schengen visa to go to your relatives in Lithuania, Latvia, Poland, anywhere else. But what else? For a simple person, uh, somewhere in the Belarusian province, why can we pursue uh, people? that this is indeed a program that provides value, that provides some added value to simple people who are living there. What can European Union do more for these people? How would you say? Well, that's a very good question, actually. You can get easily to the question why you need foreign ministries and why you need any <laughs> political engagement outside. Uh, no, first of all, I think that uh, uh, if one can uh, look at uh, what are the real, um, let's say, achievements of Eastern Partnership, then you can always show the example of Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia on three counts. Mm -hmm. The first you already mentioned, uh, visa liberalization. Well, we are not even close to visa liberalization with Belarus, but we are talking about visa facilitation, which would at least grant uh, more flexibility to, to give visas for those who want to do business or who want to do let's say, any tourism. But I think it is important. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it is important actually more for, sometimes more for grandmothers and mothers and grandparents and parents that your kid can travel and see the world than probably we can imagine. Let's not be also arrogant on this one. Sure. Second, um, trade. Uh, I think that uh, what we have seen, and by the way, this is also very interesting development. Uh, when I visit Moldova and Ukraine and Georgia, what I frequently hear, it's great to have a deep and comprehensive trade agreement that is part of association agreement. It's great that we can sell our wines, we can sell our products, but we need more quotas. We need to have more market. And I think that uh, what we can always say that if you get more trade, if you can, uh, let's say, uh, have uh, better export policies for your country, that actually uh, comes back as the greater re revenue and also increasing your, uh, let's say, uh, standard of life. The third, which we are still struggling, but I think that it could be a great next step. And again, it can help more to those who are traveling rather than those who are sitting. But uh, we are starting to discuss on a practical level how we could probably introduce what we have within the European Union for instance, uh, roaming mm -hmm. policies that we have at the EU <coughs> level, that they should be extended to, let's say, countries of Western Balkans or Eastern partner nations. Mm -hmm. uh, actually saves a lot of resources, saves a lot of money. So those are very small practical things. Yes. Not everyone will see that, but mm -hmm. at least we can, uh, we can try to, to show that uh, the trade turnover between those countries that have a trade agreements is increasing, that actually people are also reforming their own economies. They are sometimes complaining that we are not able to export more tomatoes or more wines or more grapes. But I think that uh, at the end of the day, uh, those, are, those are the answers why sometimes it's better to have more structural relationship. Are we going to reach agreements on let's say more quotas or roaming charges soon. Well, it took the Latvian presidency the whole six months period and the last day of the presidency to hammer and to push through the agreement of lifting roaming charges within the EU and it took us many years. And you get fierce, uh, let's say, fight from all the providers of, for, of mobile services, but at the end of the day, I think it was worth worthwhile to try to find the new ways how how to engage, how to make also some of those policies understandable to the wider public. Okay, thank you very much. So uh, at least three good reasons we can all get back to our relatives and explain. And mm -hmm. this is something that can, right. that that can be tangible and understandable. So now I'm happy to open the floor, tell your name, and probably study field. Uh, that would be helpful, again, to understand. I, uh, I don't know we should be 
uh, no limited by the topic or by the questions. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, probably some priority for students, and then if faculty members or diplomats obviously want to ask questions. And the first priority for our ambassadors, I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Anyone? Okay, well, so far faculty members, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, um, my name is uh, Maxim Timofeyev, I'm a faculty member uh, law, uh, legal studies. Uh, thank you, Excellency, for uh, this short and nice presentation. Um, I would like to ask a question. Uh, definitely, uh, <coughs> the Eastern Partnership is more about trade, is more about uh, engagement in um, an economical relationship, facilitation of you know movement of people. But you also mentioned that security issues and human rights issues are very important. And when we talk about Belarus, uh, one particular human rights issue arises constantly, it's a matter of the death penalty. So what, is, uh, what do you think might be uh, the steps that uh, within the uh, 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 Eastern uh, Partnership that can be done in order to persuade uh, Belarus to uh, abolish death penalty? I know that there is a lot of things uh, that the European Union and Council of Europe uh, is doing in the, on this level. Uh, there are more projects um, being done, the problem being discussed on uh, various levels. Uh, but still, I would like to hear your opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that uh, this is one of those issues where uh, we have so far disagreement between EU and its member states and Belarus. Belarus is the only country in Europe that still executes people. It's the only country that is not member of the Council of Europe. And uh, this is an issue that I have been raising constantly when I meet my Belarusian counterpart. And actually I also raised this issue when I met last with President Lukashenko in July this year. Uh, I, I was saying that uh, if we really want to get a kind of breakthrough, the political dialogue breakthrough, uh, if we really want to get some kind of uh, breakthrough at the EU level when it comes also to finding new ways of cooperation, also when it comes to economic cooperation, the death penalty issue is, should and must be addressed. Um, I know also that uh, all EU officials, when they meet their Belarusian counterparts, many of my colleagues, when they meet their Belarusian counterparts, are raising this issue constantly. Um, we had actually about more than one hour meeting with President of Belarus, and we were debating this penalty for about 15 minutes or so, which shows that it had a prominent place in the discussion. I heard his arguments. I think that uh, those are not different from you are hearing in public, that it has been uh, the decision by people at referendum. Uh, I think it was 1996 or, 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 or 1997 that uh, people would be against and uh, that it is not possible to go against the will of the people. Um, that uh, to some extent there are countries that are actually uh, that, that, that have abolished this penalty but still are finding ways how to uh, get rid of people they really don't want to be alive and uh, <coughs> my only advice and my only policy that I can say is that uh, we need to keep this issue high on agenda. Well, EU also has a very good track record raising those issues with those countries that have death penalty that are also uh, very good friends of us, be it the United States, be it Japan, be it well, the name. Uh, we, can, we can name all those countries that still have uh, executions and, and death penalties on their, on their books. And I believe also that there can be also engagement from uh, 
not only NGOs, not only uh, media, but also what I have heard that uh, also the church, be it Orthodox or Catholic church, can play more visible role. So from that point of view, uh, my experience meeting with presidents and prime ministers and ministers from countries that probably do not have uh, the same uh, democratic track record like EU is that you can get more addressing issues uh, when you meet them, when you are not making uh, loud press releases, statements, uh, shouting uh, or megaphone diplomacy exercises. But if you are kind of consist consistently pushing that each and every time you meet them, and also actually addressing those issues, then but they are interesting. Uh, frankly, I was having a very good uh, meeting back in 2015 prior to uh, Eastern Partnership Summit, because each and every Eastern Partnership Summit since 2009 <coughs> comes with the big drama and big issue for the journalists. Will President of Belarus uh, attend or not the summit. And normally this is the only question you get before any of those summits. It's not about what you are going to achieve, it's who is coming. Uh, and we had a very frank and candid exchange about then political prisoners that were in Belarus in 2015, what we considered. And we were discussing this issue at length again with our Belarusian counterparts and also with President Lukashenko. And at some point later, as you remember, they were released. And I don't believe it was because we had this megaphone diplomacy, but we were simply working tirelessly to address those issues. So this is the only recipe I can now provide. It's not going to happen today. It's not going to happen next year. But if we keep addressing and if we keep trying to find the ways how to, let's say, make this issue uh, constantly uh, on the agenda and also trying to find also ways how to accommodate the interests of that or another country, then it may work. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Next questions? Very good. Anyone? Oh, okay. Um, my name is Alexandra from Program Design and I would like to uh, ask you a question about uh, what are the ways uh, of Eastern Partnership to overcome the obvious inconvenience which are the geographical and cultural differences between all the members of this project and different speeds of uh, integration. Oh, good. That's, that's, that's a short question. <laughs> good. That's a very good question. Well, look, first of all, uh, I think that we have passed this kind of feeling, what once Professor Fukuyama described as end of history. I think he says, <laughs> not over yet. And also feelings that now we are, let's say, living great life after all the Velvet Revolutions, the singing revolutions that we actually are celebrating this year as the 30th anniversary of the Baltic Way, of the fall of the Berlin Wall and, and, and Velvet Revolution very soon, in a couple of days' time, that, uh, that, that everyone now loves liberal democracy and everyone now strives to liberal democracy. Actually, we are in the, at the point where even within the EU we are kind of trying to settle some of the inconsistencies within the EU. The rule of law issue is now becoming more and more difficult and uh, part of probably disappointment by many of EU member states is that when there was accession period of some of current EU member states the future looked a bit brighter than the present realities are and that is also the debate that we are having at the EU that uh, we also need to reform the whole accession <coughs> process, which I believe we, we need to address, because the EU is changing, the world is changing, and also our neighborhoods are changing, and we need to have some 
things that we didn't obviously believe we need to address, we need to address now. Uh, with Eastern Partnership, it's a bit um, different. On one hand, I'm hearing some of our Eastern Partners saying, we don't need Eastern Partnership. We want to have direct relationship between us and European Union. Because, well, we believe that we are better than the other guys. The other guys are saying, uh, well, we want to have very tailored approach. We don't want to be considered as front runners for EU because we don't want to join EU. But we need Eastern Partnership because we understand that it's the only framework where we can meet European leaders from time to time, where we can meet all the European foreign or, I don't know, agriculture or uh, trade ministers from time to time, because we have also sectoral ministerial meetings. And I think that from that point of view, uh, we still need to respect the decision of each and every Eastern partner nation. If Armenia doesn't want to join for obvious reasons European Union or can't sign association agreement, then let's find the ways how to address what they want. And I think we succeeded in it. We are now currently doing the same exercise with Azerbaijan. Again, this country is not going to, to join EU. This country has also a lot of issues that uh, we address when it comes to human rights record, when it comes to political freedoms. Within the Eastern Partnership, it's not only about Belarus, it's also about some other partners. Let's not forget about that as well. But still we do that. With uh, Ukraine, Moldova and Georgia, it's quite clear that those countries want to join, but uh, technically they are not ready even to start accession talks, even if we can agree on that today. We, we can't. But then uh, let's concentrate on first uh, having reforms, having our support and keeping them high on agenda and also not depriving them of this kind of uh, shining city on, up, uh, up on the hill, as once President Reagan was, was saying about democratic America and the United States. And then we have Belarus that really has a bit different interest, balancing well, their own issues, but let's try to find a way how to engage with them that is consistent with our interests and our values and with their interests. Uh, so I would say that if we would even say that let's now have separate meetings between heads of state and government of EU nations and those who have signed association agreements, and then let's have figured out any kind of uh, mechanism for, for Belarus, Azerbaijan and Armenia, I think we will lose ourselves the focus and also some of those nations would never get that attention through those frameworks we have developed since 2009 and that would be actually detrimental to, to, to them. So from that point of view, uh, I still believe that this what we call sometimes in our own slang tailored individual approach is the best way to look at the different interests of different countries. However, there are some basic principles. And uh, those basic principles that we have, that in each and every political dialogue we are addressing human rights issues. We are addressing the need to support civil society, media freedom. And by the way, media freedom issues are not uh, specifically issues only for the countries like Azerbaijan or Belarus. Sometimes we need to address those issues in Georgia, in, in Azerbaijan, uh, sorry, in uh, Georgia, in Moldova, especially uh, last year we were very much concerned about uh, developments in Moldova uh, when, it come, when it came to elections of uh, mayor of, of Chisinau when it came to some laws that were passed actually limiting media freedom. So this country has now changed. There is a new government. We will see how things are developing. But there are some basic principles that we need to push uh, with all partners that sometimes needs to be addressed not only, let's say, with countries that we normally uh, list as issues, uh, but uh, but also with countries that uh, had some very good track record. So I would uh, I would say that uh, here we have uh, good experience and also 
good uh, track record when it comes to providing Eastern Partnership as a general framework. Another thing that I didn't mention specifically, but Eastern Partnership is very good at, especially in the last years, is also engaging NGOs and civil societies. I think since Vilnius, uh, we have had NGO civil forum, society forum yeah. uh, or civil society forum uh, that actually normally is also uh, addressed by heads of state and government of EU or ministers of EU. And also that is another uh, key principle for all six Eastern partners where we are doing sometimes not very loud but still work of support for civil societies in each and every country and we need to continue to do that. By the way, Lithuania hosting this university is the great example of providing real support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay, well. Yes, please. Hi, my name is Vladislav Kozlov. I've studied media and communication. And in your lecture, you've mentioned about influence of Russia on Ukraine and potential influence of Russia in, in Belarus in, in, in terms of close integration. So my question is, are Baltic states a potential aim of Russia to expand its influence? And how can we witness and notice this fact? Thank you. Well, we are, no, 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 we are absolutely free of Russian influence. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, of, of course, uh, of course, actually, this is something that uh, we have quite a good experience of even since the beginning of our independence. Back in 1990s, we were attacked for our willingness to join NATO and the EU. We had a great experience of handling Russian propaganda uh, at times when uh, it was not an issue at all in Western Europe. But uh, my answer is right now this, yes, we do feel this influence almost daily. We are developing, I think, very good tools. But I would say that we should not be so much concerned about the Baltic states or Ukraine or Moldova or Georgia when it comes to Russian influence. Obviously there is going to be propaganda channels, there is going to be endless uh, struggle for that, but I would very much focus on those countries that think that they are on the safe side. Be it Germany, be it Scandinavian countries, be it the United States of America, be it uh, France or Spain or Italy. I think those countries uh, are now much more interesting target for propaganda efforts or hybrid warfare efforts than the Baltic states or some of Eastern partner nations because, well, we know more or less what we can expect from our friends and partners across the Eastern border. But some people are still naive. I still remember that in 2014-15 when I, my Lithuanian and Estonian colleagues, uh, also Polish and Swedish colleagues were raising issue of Russian propaganda in the Foreign Affairs Council of EU, we were getting responses. No, uh, it's about media freedom. We don't need to do anything. Then back in 2016, 2017, after some events in some of countries when it, uh, when it came to election meddling, when it came to the fake news in Berlin about one, one girl that uh, claimed that she was raped by, uh, by migrants and it turned out to be fake news fabricated everywhere else but not in, in Germany. Everyone all of a sudden woke up and said this is a big problem. And now we are, I would say, uh, making great progress at European Council level. The last European elections were addressed also from the point of view of hybrid warfare. But I would say that uh, we can provide our best expertise, we need to be constantly alerted about the new tactics and new instruments, but I would say that uh, we need to care more about our Western friends than we need to care about ourselves because we are already, uh, well, to some kind of uh, phase of what I could call uh, immune system. But again, those instruments, those mechanisms are changing. Those are not like, you know, back in Soviet times when they were uh, saying that capitalists are bad and, and we are good. It's much more nuanced, much, much more provocative uh, warfare. For instance, tackling issues that are very high on the agenda in every country, migrants. 
if if you are part of EU, you will soon be dead because there will be influx of people from Africa and Asia. That's what you sometimes hear, like like propaganda warfare about uh, decadent West, about uh, all those bad values and bad things that are coming from from Western world, and we are the only true saviors of traditional values. And I could name all those very nuanced things that are, uh, are on that agenda, and we need to constantly address them. Thank you. Anyone, any Good. questions more there? Ambassador looks very kind of concerned right now. I think we have three more or minutes. He, or he wants to ask the question. Uh, well, probably, oh, one question here, yes? Could you speak up a little bit louder? I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as most post-Soviet countries, Belarus experienced high levels of uh, hatred towards the LGBTQ plus communities. And uh, my question is, uh, are there any plans or thoughts on, on the matter of creating the less harmful environment for the members of the community in the space of uh, Eastern Partnership? Mm -hmm. Okay, look, uh, I think that unfortunately uh, also the Baltic states, if you look at different uh, public opinions, are currently not in the best, uh, in the best uh, situation because we are also struggling internally. For instance, Latvian parliament uh, failed to pass uh, the legislation allowing uh, not even same-sex marriage, it's prohibited by the constitution, but partnership. I know that this is currently debated in Estonia and it's not also easy in Lithuania, but at least we are, we are making some, uh, some uh, steps forward. If in 2005, the first prides in the Baltic states were heavily guarded by the police and they were attacked and last prides are already quite well attended and um, the acts of open hatred are a bit lesser. When you look at internet and all the um, social media, then this is quite a mixed feeling. Uh, I think that one thing that we have seen, uh, and here EU and also again its member states have been very explicit saying that uh, LGBT rights need to be preserved. If you look at Ukraine, again, those prides, have been allowed. There are still a lot of violence uh, from time to time that is being reported. The same happens with Georgia, the same happens also with other countries. And I think that uh, this issue, again, should be at the same level in our dialogue between the EU and each and every Eastern partner uh, as we have the death penalty with Belarus or as we have uh, equal opportunities with all countries or as we have that or another issue about media freedom with almost each and every uh, Eastern partner nation. <coughs> At the same time, I do also believe that uh, we can't get the pressure from outside to change something. It has to be uh, worked through within internal changes within societies. We can help to some extent through funding of organizations, through raising issues of violence, through different ways. But this change comes. Change comes incrementally. Uh, we are still, in many respects, coming from dark ages of Soviet occupation all, where those issues were not debated. We have seen progress. I myself personally would love to see more progress, uh, also for very personal reasons. It's not there. It's not there even in most of EU member states. But uh, if we keep, first of all, pressing our own societies, if we keep uh, trying to convince majority uh, of public within EU and also in your country, in uh, each of every Eastern partner nation, that uh, this is part of normal 21st century understanding of what human rights are about, then we are going to succeed. Unfortunately, it takes time, it takes sometimes courage, and it takes sometimes leadership, first of all, from EU side. So not good news for today or tomorrow, but I think that things are changing. By the way, your generation is looking at those issues much, much more differently than even my generation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.